hey, can you believe it's already November? Nothing makes me feel like an adult more than just kind of marbling over the passage of time. And yet here we are. If this is your first time popping by, I'm Melody because I realize I don't introduce myself very often. And one thing I like to do at the beginning of the month is talk about some of the books that are coming out that month that I'm anticipating, mostly because I am a mood reader and so I can't really commit to a specific TBR for the month because I just know that I won't follow through as intended. I of course have piles that I want to get to, but don't we all always have those ever-growing piles? And part of those ever-growing piles are the ridiculous number of books that come out every month. So I try to sit down at the beginning of the month and talk about some of the books that are on my radar coming out throughout the month. Now because there are the aforementioned ridiculous number of books coming out, that means that I am not talking about nearly all of them and there are many that I miss every month. So as always, if there are books you are excited about that I don't touch on today, please leave those below because we like to be excited about books together. If there are books I do talk about that you're also excited about, also let me know just because I like to get a gauge for what people are excited about, what people are anticipating. It makes it feel a little bit less of an island over here. Now because we're down to two months left in the year and by some miracle, knock on wood, I have so far talked about every month this year, which is a big deal for me. That means that we're slowing down a little bit in terms of the number of new titles that are coming out every month. So this month we have about almost half of what we had last month. And honestly, thank goodness, because last month was a little ridiculous. The TBR, especially for the end of the year, the 2023 titles that are still looming, they're piling up. So let's move into it. Before we jump all the way in, go ahead and like if you feel like it, subscribe if you feel like it. But for those of you who are new or maybe unsubscribed, you may not have enough information about me yet to really commit to that decision. I understand. But as always, we are here for the books. So let's go ahead and jump in to the first new release Tuesday of November the 7th. The first book on my radar, surprise, that was sarcastic, is a series that I am behind on. But the third in the Last Binding series by Freya Marsk, A Power Unbound, is coming out. This series really burst onto the scene with a marvelous light. And it is a kind of alternate fantasy, supernatural, historical romance series. Series. And so to my understanding, because I've only read A Marvelous Light so far, each book does follow a separate couple and the blurbs of the books support this theory. I would imagine, like with most historical romance series, that we do see the previous couples kind of meandering in and out of the narratives, but that we shift narrative focus to a new couple with each book. And so this last book is following Jack Alston, Lord Hawthorne. Now I will admit that it has been long enough since I read the first book that I don't remember encountering these characters before, though I am willing to bet we've come across them within the course of the rest of the series. So I guess if your memory is a little fresher, you can clue me in below there. And Jack had seemingly given up on magic, but a threat pulls him back into this world and puts him in contact with a writer and thief, Alan, who he has some tension with, but they have to kind of pair up to solve this mystery, to help eliminate this threat, and presumably protect magic itself, and of course, presumably as well, fall in love along the way. Now this series, at least the first one, I have heard people describe as cozy occasionally, but there is real and active danger. And so cozy seems to be kind of a loose qualifier right now. To be fair, most qualifiers are loose and it's more kind of like a state of mind and the tone and the voice with which things are written. And to my recollection, there definitely was a wit and a charm there, but we were still very much plot driven. We weren't just kind of meandering around this environment that we liked engaging with, with characters that we liked engaging with. Of course, both of those things were true as well, but we really were kind of trying to solve this central conflict. So in my mind, Cozy still feels a little bit looser, a little bit lower stakes. And so I can understand why it's been described that way or kind of looped in in that way. But I don't know if I personally, to my recollection, would classify the first book as Cozy. That being said, actually finishing the series could change my perception. But if you have thoughts on where you would classify this and whether you think it's Cozy or not, let me know below as well. But speaking of Cozy, a book I have not seen challenged in its Cozy classification despite how readers have reacted very differently to it, to my kind of observation, because I personally have not read it yet. Bookshops and Bone Dust by Travis Baltry is coming out as a prequel to Legends and Lattes, which really burst on the scene as a cozy fantasy. And I have seen kind of mixed reactions to that book, as mentioned before, mostly in relation to how cozy is kind of handled in it, and that it is, from all accounts that I have heard, a low stakes fantasy. And so I would assume that that this lives in a similar vein. So here, according to the blurb, we have an orc who was previously part of a mercenary group who is sent to this small town to kind of recuperate after something has gone awry and presumably then comes in contact with the bookshop. I will be interested to see how the bookshop portion of this is handled.
world. I can go either way on books that are very clearly aimed at readers. If it feels like it's just pandering and the kind of connection to reading life, to readers, to this whole kind of community and culture that has built up is just kind of surface level, I'm not necessarily going to respond as well. But if it is intrinsically kind of woven into the plot, it's a little bit more imaginative, it has something more to say with that, I am a little bit more on board. Although like with everything, that's not a blanket statement because if the writing is compelling enough to me, the characters are compelling enough to me, it can kind of mask a lot of that. And thus I'm a little bit more likely to buy in. But I haven't started this series yet. So I would be very interested in hearing the thoughts of other people who have read it, whether I should bump it up on my TBR. But I've been seeing a lot of chatter about this online. And so definitely still have it on the list of things I would like to get to. And then for a book I put down based on just my kind of interest in the subject matter. Because again, for those who may be new or because I don't really talk through my methodology all that often, because quite frankly, we usually have way too many books to get through to begin with. I go through a lot of lists to kind of compile what I'm interested in. I generally go through the Goodreads anticipated for the month. I look at the Millions preview. And then I also utilize Edelweiss to look at what advanced reader copies are available for request for a given month. Probably should become a little bit more adept at looking at the publisher catalogs on there, but I just haven't yet. And then as well, any books I come across organically in my kind of day to day that I become interested in, I will put down on their respective day. So that being said, this book wasn't on my radar until later. And then looking it up on Goodreads, the reviews, though not plentiful yet, are seemingly pretty divisive. And that book is The Life and Lies of Charles Dickens by Helena Kelly. Now this book purports to have new information about Dickens's physical and mental health that kind of reframes our understanding of him as a public figure and how his public narrative is actually much different than his private narrative and the kind of celebrity of Dickens. Now the blurb doesn't really give us much insight into what these revelations are, though it does seem like it insinuates that it is going to contradict some of the information and especially Dickens's first biography that he approved for after his death. Sidebar, it is centipede season in Chicago and I just watched with horror as one fell and then I managed to kill it, but that was slightly terrifying. Anyway, back to Dickens as my heart rate goes down. I haven't read any Dickens recently. I went through a Dickens phase when I was in high school. I've read a lot of the big ones like David Copperfield, like A Tale of Two Cities, like Great Expectations. I haven't read Oliver Twist, which as a theater student, you would think would have been one of the big ones for me. And with that as well, while I do have a Penguin Drop Caps edition of Great Expectations that sits hidden by my head every video, it is actually my least favorite of the Dickens I've read. All that to say, I at least have a passing familiarity with Dickens's work. However, I'm always interested in new points of view. And the new point of view in this seems to be pretty divisive based on the few early reviews. And this could be for a couple of reasons. It could be because it's positing something that isn't supported by the scholarship. It could be a kind of Dickensian Oxfordian theory. I don't know. Or it could be something something that just changes the perception of him so much that it really chafes against people and it's hard to accept. That being said, I do have some reservations based on the page count listed because it is showing it under 300 pages, at least on Goodreads, which could be inaccurate. And I don't know if that is including citations. And for something that according to the blurb, though very opaquely, is indicating that it's going to kind of change our perception on something majorly with Dickens, I would assume that it would be longer. Also because it seems to be kind of positioning itself as popular history. It would kind of want to frame what we know for readers to get their bearings, but I don't know. I have babbled on about Dickens probably too long now. We'll see what this is. I will probably be keeping my eye out for more professional reviews on this one more than any other books that are coming out this month. And then we have One Night in Hartswood by Emma Denny, which is seemingly a gay medieval romance. And I haven't read a good medieval romance in a second. And so as a historical romance reader, I'm excited to explore another time setting. This follows Raph, Rafe, but there are two Fs, correct my pronunciation if it is wrong, as his sister's betrothed has run away and he goes chasing after him because his family's honor is riding on this marriage. Meanwhile, the escaped groom, known to his friends as Penn, finds himself needing to rely on the kindness of strangers to survive. One of these strangers, the main stranger, being Raph. Now, I will be interested in how they kind of come together on this journey because it seems they kind of grow close and they have these 
secrets of who the other is. So I will be very interested to know how they kind of come across each other. Because if we have this brother chasing after an escaped bridegroom, like where does he come across this stranger in the night? Is it in a crowded place where there's this reasonable expectation that he is not the escaped bridegroom? How did he escape as a bridegroom? Like how are the secrets of these identities being kept? But I'm very intrigued by this one, particularly because of the setting. But then we have Check and Mate by Allie Hazelwood, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is her first young adult title. This is following a couple enmeshed in the world of professional chess. We had Mallory who had given up chess because it had ruined her family years ago. So I presume there's some dynamic with a parent there based on the fact that it's young adult, but I don't know, I could be wrong. But she goes to play in one last charity tournament. So I don't know, maybe there is a history of playing for her. And honestly, there are probably a lot of people who have already read advanced reading copies of this book and are kind of yelling at the sky at my attempt to kind of puzzle this out. But she wipes the board with the kind of reigning bad boy of chess, the reigning champion. And this starts a kind of rivalry between the two. Nolan, the guy she beats, is intrigued and sees her, I assume, as a worthy opponent. And she kind of re-enters this world because of all of the prize money that is attached. And she really needs that to help support her family. Now, I am way behind in the Allie Hazelwood universe. I have not read anything since the Steminitz novellas. So I really need to pick back up. I got kind of burnt out in those novellas on the like very big man, very small woman trope and the way it was described. But there's enough love for Hazelwood and her books that, hey, I want to have fun too. And then we're getting the start of a new series by Katie Robert, Hunt on Dark Waters. This looks interesting because it seems kind of paranormal in very different ways than I as a reader have experienced. It follows a witch who kind of makes some bad decisions. And in the course of those bad decisions, she ends up falling through the portal to another realm and gets kind of linked up with this group of pirates who kind of sail this protective sea between realms and their captain who is telekinetic. And so she becomes enmeshed in this group after being given the choice to basically join or die. But she doesn't have true loyalty to this group as the rest of the group really have this loyalty to their mission. And so there is this growing attraction, presumably. The blurb leads us to believe really strongly between her and the captain. But then there's also this question of her loyalty and where that lies. It is also listed as number one. So I will be very interested to know how this series is going to be shaped. Like, are we going to get a very straightforward romance kind of arc in this first book? Or are we charting out a longer con arc here? It feels in some ways kind of reminiscent of the spirit of the pirates either in Stardust or in the Shadow and Bone series or later in the Shades of Magic series. So I'm intrigued by these pirates and what they're going to end up looking like, as well as the kind of greater world that we're building out here. And then we have Good Material by Dolly Elderton, the author of Ghosts, which again, I have a copy sitting in my TBR further up on that shelf behind me every video. But this feels very much like a millennial novel, a kind of exploration of the existential crisis of living kind of novel. It follows a 35-year-old aspiring stand-up comic who is living in his best friend's spare room after the breakdown of his long-term relationship. And this kind of sets off his exploration and kind of reevaluation of those relationships, of how he's gotten to the place and the point he is in his life, and also having to look at some of this through a new lens. With that kind of comic angle and the title good material, I I have these kind of assumptions of how it's going to read. I don't anticipate this being an outright comedic piece with this kind of darkly comic, a kind of lower, slower burn of things while probably being a little existential, like I said before. So again, I haven't read Ghosts yet, so I can only kind of continue assumptions I have about what this is going to be, but it feels very much in line with the kind of Sally Rooney school of millennial existentialism. And then if we want to take that seemingly existentialism and push it to presumably the kind of experimental, maybe even expressionistic extreme. We have The Vulnerables by Sigrid Nunez, which even the blurb is like, we can't really tell you what this is going to be about, except that there's going to be some Gen Z narration and a parrot, which we see on the cover as well. It does say that it's going to be a meditation on our contemporary era and what it means to be living in the now. With that, I don't believe the blurb, at least as it's seen on Goodreads, indicates, but I believe I read somewhere that it does kind of interrogate the pandemic and the response of the pandemic and 
how our society has kind of shifted with that. So if you're not ready for that, I'm not speaking with assurances here because I have not read it, but there is that chance. Blurb, however, does mention a search for understanding of some of the most critical matters of our time, and I would definitely consider that a critical matter of our time. And then we have The Sisterhood, How a Network of Black Women Writers Changed American Culture by Courtney Thorson. This is looking at a particular group of Black women writers at the end of the 70s, including Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, and Tazaki Shange, writers today that we would think of as giants. And so I'm particularly interested in this exploration that humanizes these giants of American literature that also provides perspective on this intimate community. I'm interested in how these people that created some of the best art of a generation operated and built community and how they moved as people and as artists, how this community allowed them to advocate for each other and for themselves. And I think especially the community aspect of this is going to be key. And then presumably a much different exploration of community. We have the new Naomi Elderman, The Future. This is the author of The Power, which I read when it came out and remember really liking, but don't really remember much beyond that. If The Power was exploring the patriarchy, The Future is presumably exploring class. The blurb mentions The Future in capitals as something where the richest have realized the money is. So that makes me think that The Future is both the theoretical and a more tangible in this book. The more tangible presumably being a vehicle through which we can explore the theoretical more successfully. But the blurb is not all theoretical. It alludes to a heist novel of sorts and its cast of characters, including the daughter of a cult leader, a non-binary hacker, an ousted Silicon Valley visionary seem particularly interesting and also a way to explore different perspectives of this like larger umbrella idea with a capital I behind the novel. Okay, moving on to November 14th. We are perfectly aligned with our sevens times tables this month. That is surprisingly difficult to say. However, the rest of the month is going to be slightly pared back from the first of the month because again, the first of the month is further away from the end of the year and they're trying to push as much out before we get really too close to the end of the year. Not that things aren't going to keep trickling through because again, to my anecdotal experience, it doesn't really feel like we are getting fully quiet weeks in publishing anymore. Or maybe I personally am just a lot less discerning. But the first book of the 14th is Plot Twist by Erin LaRosa, which follows a romance author who has been outed for never having been in love. I'm not gonna lie, this concept feels familiar even from this year, but it still sounds interesting. We're gonna go with it. So this romance author is going to chronicle her journey to love and in the process enlists the help of her landlord, who is also a former teen heartthrob. And because of that, he has social media a little bit more figured out. Apparently he is also an anonymous online crafter. And of course, feelings are going to become involved because obviously. So we will see whether she is able to fully chronicle her journey to love or not. Now I am going to be interested if we continue to see this kind of trope popping up. Like is it going to start chafing for me in the way that like playwrights writing about playwrights or theater people does? Or because it's a book and seemingly more of your readership, your audience are in on the game, if it will land better? I don't know. But I don't know so I guess we will find out. Then another romance novel from an author I have read that is seemingly a bigger deviation from the novels I have read, Do Your Work by Rosie Dannon. And this follows an occult expert Riley who travels to a Scottish castle to break a curse and comes in conflict with an archaeologist Clark who has a site at the same castle. So their interests are in conflict but that doesn't seem to stop them from enjoying the payoff of some mutual attraction but that also presumably further complicates their own interests. And then we have The New Naturals by Gabriel Bump which based on the blurb I think may end up being an interesting conversation with the survivalists which we talked about earlier this year for a feature Friday. And The New Naturals follows a young black woman bereft after the loss of a newborn child. Definitely stole the word bereft from the blurb, credit where credit is due. And this leads her to an abandoned restaurant on a hill off the highway. And she has this vision of a utopia where everyone has an equal shot. And her vision starts gaining traction and people are hearing about it and coming to this place. And so it's this kind of exploration of whether this utopia can be realized or not. And also presumably a look at community and the kind of current moment we're in. But I'm also kind of fascinated with this concept. Because for me, if you conjure the idea of utopia, now you might get something 
like The World in Pet by Oweke Amezi. But often if I'm playing kind of word association with Utopia, I think of cults because so many cults start as this idea of something better and this utopia and whether that can actually be realized in its truest form. And so I'm not saying this is a cult book, but I am interested in this idea of how we build community and how community can morph and shift with differing personality types and what the realization of this dream looks like. And I think especially exploring this within our modern moment is incredibly compelling and I'm very, very interested in this book. Speaking of things that kind of explore the modern moment from a presumably decidedly different angle, we have The Book of Anne by Lexi Freeman. Now this feels like it is going to lean in fully to satire and based on the blurb it's either really going to work for me or it's not. But I am intrigued by something that definitely seems like it's committing to something a little bit more out there. And so according to the blurb, this book follows a young woman, Anna, who writes a piece that is deemed classist by the literary community and she is shunned. And in this shunning, she becomes radicalized by the works of Anne Rand. So she fully commits to this philosophy, drops everything, moves to LA to follow this dream of creating a television show around this new hero of hers. But in the process, she realizes the limits, mostly I assume, when her money runs out and she has to run back to New York. But that's also seemingly a short stop because the blurb also mentions her running off to the Isle of Lesbos and living in a commune. And so this book really does seem like it's going to be exploring the extremes, which really does support that kind of satirical look at things, especially because according to the Goodreads listing, it's only around 257 pages. So it's very short. And so I assume we're going to be kind of cycling through these philosophies and kind of taking them on and shedding them as they serve us very quickly in a way that really kind of analyzes how we kind of frame ourselves in the modern moment. There are a lot of books this month that are kind of grappling with the modern moment. Maybe they think that we're in a more reflective mood at the end of the year. I don't know. Confirm or deny below whether you're feeling more reflective as we ease into the end of the year here. And then we have a young adult suspense novel, Only She Came Back by Margot Harrison. This is being billed for fans of Holly Jackson or Courtney Summers. And while I am definitely behind on Courtney Summers, I am still a fan of Courtney Summers. I would classify myself. And while this is YA, it does seem like it's going to be older YA because our characters are graduated from high school from the way I am interpreting the blurb because it follows the unlikely friendship between two young women, a true crime obsessed Sam and her former high school classmate Katie, who is associated, implicated in the murder of her influencer boyfriend. And so as these two get closer, Katie or Kiri as the larger world now knows her, starts to confide in Sam. And so Sam starts to become part of the true crime story she has been obsessed with. And so I have been very interested in these kinds of stories. Obviously, we have seen an influx in these kind of true crime narratives and exploring the kind of fascination with true crime and the kind of zeitgeist. And so like with all of them, I'm interested to see if this is going to interrogate that obsession a little more actively. And then on the 21st, we have Critical Hits, Writers Playing Video Games, edited by Carmen Maria Machado and J. Robert Lennon. Now, I'm not really a video game player. I didn't really graduate past Super Nintendo or Game Boy Advance, but there are a lot of really intriguing writers writing about video games in this collection, and I am super interested in how they are going to talk about storytelling framed through video games, because I really am fascinated by the storytelling behind video games. I just don't have hand-eye coordination. And so here we have contributors the likes of Nane Kwame Ajay Brenya, Alexander Chi, Hanif Abdurraqib. There are some real giants and real voices in this collection. And so I am extremely excited to see what this is going to be, especially Hanif Abdurraqib's essay. I just keep thinking back to the structure of the essays in A Little Devil in America, and I just marvel every time. And so I'm just really interested to see how he's going to weave the threads in whatever essay he's contributing to this collection. And then the other book for the 21st I have on my radar, I'm going to have to read the title off for you because it's a little too long for me to just rattle off from memory. A True Account, Hannah Masary's Sojourn Amongst the Pirates, written by herself by Katherine Howe. So this is the author of the Physic Book of Deliverance Dane, and then there was a follow-up to that. I have been kind of like middle of the road on Katherine Howe books. I remember being particularly disappointed by her young adult novel that was supposed to center around the Salem Witch Trials, but like a modernized version. And the books that I've read by her have lived in the witchcraft realm. It seems to be going back to the kind of Deliverance Dane narrative style of having a journal discovered by an academic and moving back and forth in this kind of dual timeline kind of scenario where 
the discovery of this information in the journal is informing the journey of the person on the other end of the journal in the more modern timeline. I say more modern because the person on the other end of the journal in this book is according to the blurb in the 30s. But as discussed last week, I clearly have this history with books told through a journal format and I am interested to see what the exploration of the pirate history is going to be here. And also for me personally, the cold weather is just good for historical fiction like this. Let me know if you agree or disagree about the perfect weather for reading historical fiction below. Obviously it also depends on the kind of historical fiction, but for now that's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, let's wrap the month up with the books releasing November 28th, starting with Gwen and Art Are Not in Love by Lex Croucher. This follows Arthur, a descendant of King Arthur, and Gwendolyn, a princess of England, who are betrothed despite the fact that they cannot stand each other. However, as they get to know each other better, they discover that faking a romance with each other will ultimately help them out with the lives and the loves they truly want. This is a queering of the Arthurian legacy in a seemingly alternate history kind of universe. That being said, betrothing an Arthur and a Gwendolyn in a world where the Arthurian legends are real or history or who knows because I haven't read this does seem like a choice, but we'll see what kind of choice when we dive in fully. And then we have the start of a new historical series, It Had to Be a Duke by Vivian Lorett. Our protagonist Verity gets herself into some trouble after a snooty neighbor comes back bragging about her season and her suitors and Verity indicates that she is betrothed to a duke who also happens to be like a sworn nemesis of her family. And when the Duke Magnus comes to set the record straight he finds himself entwined further in this plot and I would be willing to place a bet that it is not a lie for long. And then we have Godly Heathens by H.E. Edgman which envisions a world in which gods are reincarnated into teenagers in Georgia and this is a world in which these gods have complicated histories that these teenagers including our protagonist Jim are going to have to figure out in order to be able to kind of navigate the future. And so it's this kind of colliding of an unknown past with the future. And then we have The Kingdom of Swedes by Erica Johnson, which I am kind of on the fence about. This is the author of the Queen of the Tearling series, which started out for me incredibly strong, and the ending was a little lackluster for me. And this is a retelling, a reimagining of The Nutcracker, and it seems to be told through the perspective of Natasha, who is living in her sister Clara's shadow. And so we'll see how this shapes up and how the Sugar Plum Fairy plays into everything. And so finally for the month, we have A Demon's Guide to Wooing a Witch by Sarah Holly, which is the sequel to a witch's guide to fake dating a demon. I read the first in the series on audio last month and I'll talk more about it in my October wrap up but quite enjoyed it and so I'm excited to follow up with the sequel which I will probably also do on audio. It follows a demon Astaroth who was behind a soul bargain in the first book that didn't end super well for him and has resulted in his memories being wiped for this book and it also involves Caladia who is the heir to one of the preeminent witch families in town and also happens to be the best friend of the person whose soul Astaroth tried to steal in the first book. So she doesn't have super magnanimous feelings toward him. However, also realizing he has no memory, she can't bring herself to just leave someone completely helpless, and so they become more entwined. I'm particularly interested to know if Caladia is going to have a nice showdown with her mom in this book, because she was particularly insufferable in the first book. And with that, that is November. We are truly in the home stretch now. So like I said before, let me know what you are excited about this month, whether it's been mentioned here or not. Like and subscribe again if you feel like it, but is always much appreciated and does help me out. But as always, sincerely, this is not just a line. I truly appreciate you being here and caring at all about what I have to say about books. Read something good, most importantly, and yeah, bye.